Hi, hello, and welcome, or welcome back, I suppose. I think as either part of one of my six of the best blind bags, or from a blind date with a book, I read Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. It's a great book, and I remember thinking I'd like to read more from her. It was one of those where I had the audiobook alongside the physical book, I knew it was literary fiction, and I also knew it was containing a lot of stuff about, like, intricate financial details, or I assumed it would. I knew that there was stuff about a Ponzi scheme in it, and I can sometimes just need a little help with focusing and taking it all in, so I listened to the audiobook and read the physical at the same time. And I have listened to the audiobook a couple of times since, because it's not one that I got on BorrowBox, it's one that I got on Audible when I was using that a bit more regularly. Listened to it a couple of times since. It's still a great book, though I'll be totally honest with you, subsequent listenings, I guess, would be more than the same readings, but they've been a lot more passive. I have not been as into it. But I did do the same this time, with reading and listening at the same time. I usually wouldn't mention it, but it does come up a little bit later on. Anyway, all this to say, a few months back, because <laughs> let's not talk about how long these books have been sat on my to-be-read pile, I saw one of more recent books. I think it's from a year or two ago, and I figured I'd give it a little look-see, and the blurb alone told me I would kick myself if I didn't pick it up and read it. I'd just keep thinking about how I should have done. So today, we're looking at Sea of Tranquility, by Emily St. John Mandel, and I will say now, there are spoilers ahead. I usually avoid them, but this is a narrative with time travel and interconnecting narratives, and I want to be able to talk about them freely. And when I was writing this script initially, I wasn't expecting it to go the way it did. This is also going to be a long script. This is going to be a much deeper dive than I was initially expecting. It might be kind of more obvious the way I'm talking in the beginning compared to the way I'm talking at the end. I don't think I fully expected to go through the plot the way I have, but yeah, if you want to avoid spoilers for this one, I understand. But for those of you who are sticking around, let's get into it. So this book follows four different people. Well, it's really following one person, observing the rest, but for the sake of keeping things simple, we're following four people. We have Edwin St. John St. Andrew, usually just Edwin St. Andrew, Mirella Kessler, Olive Llewellyn, and Gaspary Jacques Roberts. All from different points in time, but they are all interconnected. Now, in Mirella's case, it's more that we're following her because she's tied to someone called Vincent, who does happen to be from Glass Hotel. There's... It is hard to explain, but there's an event at four points in time in two physical places, all happening at once. It's better explained within the narrative, but it's still also hard to explain it succinctly, as I was trying to do close to the beginning. But you will see references to it later on, so don't worry about that. I'll leave it that you... <sighs> I'll leave it at this. At its core, there's an anomaly in time, and there is an institute trying to figure out what's causing that anomaly. And that's the most basic rundown you need for me to be able to start talking about this. And I was like, oh, I'll explain anything else as I go, not thinking I was going into like huge amounts of detail. We are going into detail, so maybe I didn't need to do that, but it can be still a bit useful to have a quick rundown from the start. But as you know, if you've seen any of my videos before, I always start with talking about the initial quote. The initial quote? The initial line, anyway. Edwin St. John St. Andrew, 18 years old, hauling the weight of his double-sainted name across the Atlantic by steamship, eyes narrowed against the wind on the upper deck. He holds the railing with gloved hand, impatient for a glimpse of the unknown, trying to discern something, anything, beyond the sea and sky, but all he sees are shades of endless grey. Now it's beautiful! A lot longer than I was expecting, especially for an open line. And look, I'm not the sort of person that's like, everything has to be quick, zippy, eye-catching. But I'm always surprised when something goes on this long for the opening line. It definitely does set certain... It'll, it'll turn some readers away, I think, but that's fine. 
it's never going to turn me away. It's always just, I think it's more that like, you wouldn't necessarily notice it if you are just reading, but when you have to write out things like that every time to get it in notes and scripts and things like that, you always go, wow, that's, there, there's a lot of punctuation that isn't a full stop in there. <laughs> but I think that I don't have many complaints about this book, to be honest, but Edwin doesn't really seem like he's only 18. And that makes sense for the later parts of the book. He has gone through a fair amount, which we will explore later. But, I mean, there are aspects that make it clear that he's kind of young, but maybe it's because we're writing a historical figure. He's not an actual historical figure, but a, an upper class person within history. It's a bit tricky to find that balance between somebody who feels time-wise older and somebody who still is young. But, I mean, this is going to make me sound like a bit of a nonce, I'm aware of that, but Edwin seems very mature for his age. <laughs> and the other thing is, and maybe I either missed a reason for this, or I missed a couple of other sort of mentions around this, but he's pretty much only Edwin St. Andrew for the entire rest of the book. I don't remember him being, as Mandel puts it, double sainted at any other point. It's not a major issue, but if that's your opener, I think consistency could be good. But honestly, that's about the only critique I have for this book. So let's really get into the good stuff. So for Edwin's section, we're in 1912 and he's effectively been shipped off to Canada by his like rich toff dad for being like, maybe India would prefer it if their colonizers weren't around. And according to Daddy Dearest, you know, the bare minimum respect of brown people isn't okay so off he goes to Canada but you know despite being as he occasionally has put it exiled he's still basically just on a big old holiday and Mandel captured just really nicely that particular type of man that kind of Etonian from a long line of other Etonians probably would have been at Oxford or Cambridge if he hadn't been shipped off. Bear in mind, he is 18. And maybe he has some more, quote-unquote, progressive thoughts. But really rocking the boat is out of the question. And even though he's been shipped away, he's still getting a hefty allowance coming his way. Though it is objectively quite funny that he's paid a higher allowance than his brother exclusively to keep him out of England because his brother is also away I believe he if I remember rightly he's in Australia yeah because I remember thinking oh god has he been shipped off but it's too late for him having been like shipped off as a criminal he's just trying to make a life over there but <laughs> it's like no I will pay you more if you don't come back I did think that was quite funny <laughs> and maybe I would feel more sorry for you know for him being strung up on his own but not so much when, you know, he's cashing fat checks from daddy's account and having a great time doing bugger all. Like, I'd happily let someone pay me a fat allowance to do nothing in Canada. And I'd hate Canada. It's cold and full of French people, but I'll go if there's, a, like, an incentive. But the point is, Mandel captured that very particular type of toff really brilliantly. It's really typified in this one scene where he's met another old Etonian both of whom have this idea of starting a farm. Not together, but they both have the same idea. And it's so clear that neither of them have ever had to do a day's labour in their lives. I suppose it's quite hard work, farming, he says after a while. Physically taxing. I suppose so. When Edwin imagined himself in the new world, he always saw himself in his own farm. A verdant landscape of, well, some unspecified crop, tidy but also vast. But in truth, he never thought much about what the work of farming might actually entail. Taking care of horses, he supposes. Doing a bit of gardening. Digging up fields. Then what? What do you actually do with the fields once you've dug them up? What are you digging for? I just think that works perfectly. Of that, oh, I have this idea of owning something. But 
you know that the only way they will keep that land alive is through other people's labor because there's no way they're going to get off their arse and do it themselves. And I will say, this opening chapter does feel a little slower than the others, but I was still really into it. And it's basically when we get towards the end of the chapter where we see the first sighting of the anomaly that things do start to pick up. It's very clear that this is a character-driven narrative, which is my personal preference. And at this point, we are just following the jaunts of an early 20th century man gallivanting around Canada, just having a pleasant time. We haven't got to the weird stuff yet, so it does feel a little slower, but that's not a bad thing at all. And the ease of reading despite pace is really bolstered by Mandel's slightly unusual writing style. It depends where we are in the book as to the frequency of this, but Mandel loves a scene break and she loves her short chapters. So even when the narrative is slower, we still have the effect of movement. In some of these early chapters, we have scenes as long as you might expect a regular paragraph to be, and I do really dig it. And as he's on his Canadian travels, he lands in a tiny village called Kayette. And it's while here, he ends up in the woods, not particularly by choice, but that isn't necessarily the important part. So at the entry, we get this gorgeous passage, even if it is a little haunting. He keeps walking and then at some distance, still feeling their eyes on his back and wishing to convey an impression of having some sort of important errand to attend to, he turns towards the wall of trees. He never goes into the forest because he's afraid of bears and cougars, but now it holds a strange appeal. He'll step in a hundred paces, he decides. No more. Counting off a hundred paces might calm him. Counting has always calmed him. And if he walks straight for the full hundred, then surely he can't get lost. Getting lost is death, he can see that. No, this whole place is death. No, that's unfair. This place isn't death. This place is indifference. This place is utterly neutral on the question of whether he lives or dies. It doesn't care about his last name or where he went to school. It hasn't even noticed him. He feels somewhat deranged. And it's in this forest he finds a maple tree. And from that moment, this book becomes markedly different. This is where we first see the anomaly and where we first meet Gaspery. He's in the woods with Edwin asking about what he just saw. He's also in priest get up and continues questioning Edwin at the chapel. He also bolts the moment the actual priest comes in. <laughs> it's, it's it's somewhat comical where he's like, no, no, the priest, the, the real priest, he doesn't say it like that, but it's like the, the regular priest, he's away, he's on business or something, he's, he's on, on a boat, I think is what he said. <laughs> Details like that are hard to remember when I've got so much else going on. But it's like as soon as the actual priest walks back in, because Edwin doesn't fully believe him, he just leaves it, it, seemingly in a flash. It's great. And the moment he walks into the forest, this book changes. It so far felt like an interesting but mundane, not in a bad way, but mundane and just sort of like daily life kind of mundane historical novel. And that maple tree and the anomaly around it is a shift in the book. And it's so good. This is where the pace picks up because there's no going back to mundanity after this. Which is why I think it was a really cool choice to have a callback essentially to Glass Hotel. In that one of the main characters, Vincent, ends up married to a man who scammed people out of millions with the Ponzi scheme. As with this, for those affected, there's a before and an after. No going back once the scheme goes up in smoke and the victims lose everything. And it's the partner of one of these victims we follow next called Morella, whose husband took his own life when he lost everything because of the Ponzi scheme. And a lot of my early notes for this chapter were trying to figure out if these were the Glass Hotel characters being spoken of. like. A girl called Vincent? That's not a coincidence. Her brother called Paul as well, and he's a composer. Oh, a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, this is this is definitely a post-Glass Hotel world. And yes, it does somewhat follow on from that book, but you don't have to have read it. You can absolutely read this knowing nothing about it and still have everything you need. It's basically, yeah, an Easter egg. It's basically an Easter egg. It's more a sort of oh, I recognise these characters and I know the story that they're talking about, but everything is still explained to you in enough detail that you can understand it. 
the 2020 section is about Vincent as much as it is Morella. We are mostly centered around a music performance from Paul. Vincent's sister? No. Vincent's brother, I've written sister there. During this performance, he uses footage from a video took when she was a teenager in the woods where they grew up in a little Canadian village called Cayette. And she's walking towards the big old maple tree, but when she gets close, the footage basically corrupts and we hear strange sounds, we hear violin music that isn't from Paul, and at the end we hear this whoosh sound and it's impossible for them to know what that is but it is exactly the same thing that Edwin went through and I really liked how quickly we centered everything together we see that footage right near the start of this whole section admittedly yes I am kind of impatient but I also I compliment the patience of authors all the time so obviously it's not something that I'm always wanting I want things to be resolved or this isn't a rev resolution but I want things to come together really quickly but I also I just I like having a good and clear focal point a centering thing especially given that the time travel element within this book with Gaspery becomes clear later in this chapter it's nice to have an anchor and this anomaly is our anchor point Morella, Gaspery, Paul and a fan of Paul's end up going for a drink together after the show and it's so good. We have Gaspery very clearly trying to ask about the footage. The fan just keeps on being a fanboy and you can feel Morella about to snap because Vincent was her friend. She's separated herself from Vincent because Vincent was married to the guy who put the Ponzi scheme together, who effectively is the reason her husband's dead. So they separated themselves and she's like, maybe Vincent didn't know. Maybe Vincent wasn't aware. So she went, she went to talk to her. She wanted to go back, maybe start a friendship up and she's found out that she's no longer with us. So she's constantly just trying to get a question in, but she's not quite there. And this fan just keeps asking questions, keeps asking questions and Gasprey's not doing any better. But... It's also just, oh, and you can just feel that tension rising and rising. It's so good. And eventually she just interrupts the fan to get a question out because she's sick of it. And there is just, oh, you know when you're reading something and you can feel that tension in your chest and when somebody finally snaps, it's just like, oh, oh, it's so good. But it is during this drink session that Morella realizes that she's definitely seen Gaspery before despite feeling like she can't have done because she's an adult now I believe in her 30s this is a man she she's either in her 30s or she's in her late 20s this is a man she's pretty sure she saw in her childhood but he looks exactly the same not in a oh well maybe he's a couple of years older and he just ages slowly sort of thing like he looks exactly the same like, I'll get into this a little bit more detail later, but um, for a bit of future context, this is obviously a time travel book. At the time of Paul's performance and this drink session, Morella has seen Gaspery before. Gaspery has never seen her. Joys of time travel. It's the first meeting for one. It's a second meeting for the other. And we do get a little flashback of the moment we saw him. She's walking home from school with her sister and they have to go through an underpass. And they see that two men have been shot under there. And there is a third man with a gun. This being Gaspery. And he looks at her and says her name. And my blood genuinely ran cold. It is such a horrifying moment. She is a small child. And that would be horrifying enough as an adult. Just, you can really feel in that moment that place with Morella and with Mandel like sorry with Morella Mandel uses something so simple so well it's literally just saying her name but this is a man she's never met before and then if you met him years down the line yeah she that chapter ends with her feeling like she's losing it a little bit but we then move to the year 2203 
Oh, and by the way, the we are in 2020 in that last section. I don't think I mentioned that we're at the start of 2020. It's January. So the pandemic is on its way, but it's not lockdown or anything like that yet. It's kind of important because things like big historical events being on the horizon are key in all three so in edwin's case this is 1912 it's obviously just before the second world sorry the first world war in the case of where we're with morella and vincent and everything that's just before the pandemic months before lockdown and that is going to be the same in this section as well so in 2203 we're following author olive llewellyn in general it's not my favorite section but it's very useful and i just mean this first section we see with her i like the stuff with her later on it's just this first time we see her it's it's by no means bad it just doesn't stand out in the way that many of the other parts did but there are things to know so i'm just going to do a quick rundown of them so one we established that by this time moon colonies are a thing and I'm pretty sure by this point, people are already branching out further than the moon. If not by this point, then that's a thing that's going to be starting to happen soon. Two, Olive is someone who writes about and does lectures on pandemics. She is a fiction author, but pandemics still play a part in the th stuff that she talks about. And it's especially prevalent because as we're seeing her, cases are emerging. We're seeing the early stages of something about to break out. They're at that January 2020 level. If we're not locking down yet, maybe we should be taking some precautions soon, sort of thing. Three, she is currently on a tour to promote her latest book. She's on Earth, though she is on... She lives, and I believe she said she spent a lot of time on one of the moon colonies. And that's where her family is as well. Four, she's got a publisher called Loretta. She comes up again later, even if I forget to bring it up. I think I remember to put that in my script. But her publisher's Loretta is important, and I really like the way she was used. Five, she previously wrote a book called Marion Bad with a character called Gaspary Jacques, who we later learn effectively has a scene in her book. I can't remember if it's Gaspary Jacques that actually has a scene, but it's in that book where there is a scene that is effectively the opposite side of the maple tree anomaly going from one place and then seeing the maple tree rather than the other way around and six she's doing interviews for this tour and her final interview is of course with gaspery and in this interview we have a moment where gaspery asks about that scene in her book her gasp her Gaspery, or who, whichever character it is, is in a place called Oklahoma City Airship Terminal, which, for a bit of context, is basically where you would get from to get between Earth, the Moon, any other colonies later on. I'm not sure, again, if this point they're already on other places, but they're, they're the space travel points, the airship terminals. But she feels like she'll sound too sort of eccentric if she is on the record, but she's happy to answer his question off the record. He obliges, and that's how we end this section. And then we go to the year of 2401. And I went from, yeah, I'm having a good time with this book. I'm enjoying the experience to, I was desperately trying to put the pieces together. I genuinely might have felt a bit like a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> but I... I genuinely was, like, this was the point where a lot of my notes started to become, oh, wait, but what about this? And does this make sense? And I bet that's what's going to happen. This is Gaspery's chapter, and I was immediately really excited for it. I was seeing pretty early on that it was looking like Mandel was doing a good job with keeping a timeline straight and keeping it easy to follow. And that only continues as the book goes on. It her work with keeping timelines straight and making it so a reader can keep up with it even a reader who's not necessarily good with that sort of thing i.e me i think it's incredibly commendable in any time travel fiction and i knew nothing in this early part of the section just how well her timeline fits together i genuinely am in awe of it
We do learn that he was named after the character in Oliver the Wellens' Marion Bad, as it was his mother's favourite book. And I did wonder, like, <laughs> which way round that would be. Had she seen his name somewhere and used it, or was it this way round? And it's little details like this that work so well. Would he do what he did in the interview, if not for the connection with his mother? Like, that felt like the kickoff for a lot of other stuff, and we'll get to that later on. And it's not necessarily a guarantee that that's the case, but we have a lot of interconnected stuff. So I haven't spoken about it much, but we do learn that while his mother was in hospital, as she was dying, she spoke about the fact that maybe we're in a simulation, and that is a huge part of what the Time Institute is researching in regards to this anomaly. And then we have the connection to Marion Bad and him meeting the woman that created that, the woman that created the book that gave him his name. But we'll get to what happens in her interview relatively shortly. But obviously we're later in the timeline. But like Oliver Llewellyn, Gaspery was raised in Colony 2, the second off-Earth colony on the moon. In fact, he grew up down the road from Llewellyn's former home, donned with that kind of blue plaque. I don't think it's called a blue plaque in this, but it's effectively the same sort of thing. In that house, for a while at least, I think for a few months, is a girl of Gaspery's age called Talia. He can see that there's something off about her family, but it won't be until his adulthood that he finds out just why they're so vacant all the time, never seeming like they're fully present. And while Gaspery's time with Talia is short in their younger years, they do regain contact as adults. Gaspery moves to Colony 1, where he gets a security job at the Grand Luna Hotel, where Talia is in a kind of HR-type role. And it's a steady job, nothing too interesting. He's on the 9-to-5 type, day-in, day-out life. Things aren't bad, but there's nothing... There's no interest, really. And then he gets a call from his sister, Zoe, a call that changes everything. She works at the Time Institute, and I will say, there are little hints in Llewellyn's chapter about the Institute being built. It's never explicitly brought up that that's what they're talking about, but it's very clear. Anyway, Zoe works at the Time Institute and asks him to meet her there. She shows him a clip from Paul Smith's show, the section with Vincent's footage. Now, like I said, this section with Gaspery set me off on my conspiracy stuff but when the concept was brought up I thought oh this was going to be like a cause and effect type thing I thought Gaspery she was going to see him on that footage and given they're at the time institute they'd most likely be the reason of him being there so they've got to like backtrack and set that up and I guess I obviously figured that this would have something to do with I mean, I didn't know it was an anomaly at this time, but with the thing around the maple tree, shall we say, that I figured it had something to do with that. But it's me just being a conspiracy theorist. It was just about the footage of... It was just about Vincent's footage. It's just about the anomaly. And Zoe also describes a passage from Llewellyn's Marion Bad, the one that I was talking about earlier, effectively describing the opposite of Vincent's footage. A man in an airship terminal, feeling bewildered, confused, and with visions of the maple tree. Knowing that this could be a coincidence, or Llewellyn might have seen that footage, Zoe produces one more piece of evidence. A letter from 1912 sent by Edwin St. Andrew, once again with a description of the anomaly. And I really liked how they did this particular bit in the audio. So each section has its own narrator. And for the letter, we had the narrator for Edwin's section reading it out and I know that's a simple thing and it's something that we see in TV films all the time is the most basic person writing the letter reads it out but you don't most audiobooks are read by one or two narrators it's usually one maybe two if we have two POVs overtly in some like romance fiction where we have the two POVs we'll have the usually when it is male and female as well but yeah i just i really liked it it's small details it always just looks like oh it brings things together it's like it's not necessary but it's like a cherry on the cake it's really nice 
and Zoe goes on to at least try to explain to Gaspery that it appears to be basically like file corruption with her in the Institute leaning towards this being a suggestion that we are in fact living in a simulation something is corrupting the simulation's file and it's tied to Oklahoma City airship terminal and the maple tree in Kayette and while Gasper isn't a complete idiot he does have a certain energy about him in this scene where I'm reminded of any given conversation with my brother where he's talking about like mathematical type stuff or computer stuff and numbers and abbreviations are just they will forever be a mystery to me and whenever he's talking to me it feels like my brain is just filled with static it's a really nice depiction of that it's like i'm not an idiot not completely but if you give me some things that i can't i just can't wrap my head around it genuinely feels like my brain is rejecting it now in the following days gaspery feels well not his best rather existential about the whole possibly being nothing more than a bit of code thing and ends up talking to Talia about it at work. Side tangent, they bring up that there's a colony or colonies on Titan, and I was just like, I know nothing about space. Not really. Why is Titan always a visitable or habitable location in sci-fi? I know it's not currently one of those things, and I mean that in just the term of we can send a human being there, like we can send a human being to the moon, and that's about the only place we can send a human being outside of Earth by now. That is a location. It's not just on the space station sort of thing. So I was like, is it a bigger moon? Like one of those is basically a miniature planet. And I, throughout my university, at least through my undergrad, had a long-suffering flatmate who I'm pretty sure their degree was a four-year master's in interplanetary physics looking at more like what's going on at any given space body rather than looking at the space stuff itself that's probably not quite right but in my defense she has a big brain and i can't be expected to understand her deeply complex degree <laughs> but i asked her big brain that she is and according to her titan is and i quote big big boy only moon with a big atmosphere, has liquid on the surface, and is very, very cold. So, while not currently habitable by human beings, it does make sense as to why it's a sort of sci-fi stalwart. Anyway, I got distracted by that, and I figured I would take you on my journey. Back to the book itself. <laughs> Later, he's talking to his sister about the idea of being the one to do the travelling and figure out what's happening. Though his sister is more than a little reluctant to let this happen, she nearly left the institution a couple of years ago. Well, a couple of years prior. Her only rule being that if she is to stay there and keep working, she will not travel anymore. So, Gaspery, picture the scene. You step into a party at some long ago point in time, and you know how and when each and every person in that room is going to die. That's pretty creepy, I admitted. And some of them are going to die in the most preventable ways, Gaspery. You might be talking to a woman, let's say. She has a young children and you know she's going to drown at a picnic next Tuesday. And because you can't mess with the timeline, the only thing you absolutely cannot do is say to her, don't go swimming next week. You have to let her die. You can't pull her from the water. And once again, this sets off the little conspiracy brain where I was like, oh, that's what the underpass incident is all about. He's like accidentally saving someone. And I thought, one, it was a case of him knowing all about Morella, which kind of is true. Like, by the time we get to the revelation about that, it's clear that he does know about her. And I thought it was sort of the other way around <laughs> to what it is. So I thought, oh, it was like an early job for him and he made a mistake and that's why he says her name. But if anything, it's, um, it's the other way around. <laughs> but the thing is, I was loving that this was bringing out this side of me that just wanted to figure stuff out. And I knew I not, might not be smart enough to clock stuff early on, but I was buzzing with this. I just loved being able to really 
dive in. For the next three weeks, Gasbury's life is, well, achingly normal. No contact from his sister after her refusal to let him take the job. Working, eating, hanging out with his cat Marvin. It might have been fine if the option of something more interesting weren't just out of reach. But on a day off, he heads to the Institute. The thought of missing out on this eat is just eating at him incessantly. Rather than Zoe, Gaspery happens upon an old friend, Ephraim. He finds out Ephraim actually works there, to his surprise, but that's an opening to find out if he knows about Zoe's project. Given this is the sort of place where everything is rather confidential, Ephraim pulls him inside to continue their chat. Before they really get the chance to talk, Zoe is in Ephraim's office. It's painfully clear that she does not want her brother taking this job, but Gaspery will try, nonetheless, to at least get Ephraim on side. He knows this work is interesting. He's willing to put in the time. He is sick of a mundane life where nothing happens. And this job would be so interesting. There's a back and forth between Ephraim and Zoe, but in the end, a screening interview is set up for Gaspery to see if he has what it takes. But if it called for a celebration, why was my sister speaking so little? Why did she look so grim? A troubling line of work. Look, I wanted to tell her, as Ephraim ordered three glasses of champagne. I would rather do a dangerous job than a job that makes me comatose with boredom, but I was afraid if I said this, she might start to cry. In the meantime, he is still at the hotel job, and while he's getting towards his final days there, Talia asks if they can talk, and she knows he's ready to hand in his notice. And after having to have reference type talks, she knows he's headed to the Time Institute once he's gone from this hotel. We learn that her parents had worked for the Institute until a mission in some way had gone horribly wrong. Within a year of the incident, the Institute had left them out on their asses in the place where Gaspari and Talia had first met, which is why they were so vacant when he saw them. Sometimes the Time Institute goes back in time and undoes the damage, ensures that the Traveller doesn't do anything that changes history. You know, the little things. Like, you hold the door open for the woman who goes on to create a civilization-ending algorithm or whatever. Sometimes they go back and undo the damage, but not always. Do you know how they make that decision? That sounds extremely classified, I said. Oh, it is, Gaspery. Here's the metric. They only go back and undo the damage if the damage affects the Time Institute. Look, I understand why you'd want to work with the Time Institute, she said. But just know that when the Time Institute is done with you, they'll throw you away. But despite the warnings from his sister and from Talia, Gaspery finds that he just can't go back to the hotel. No turning back. And the thing is, conceptually, I get it. Would I have the balls, or frankly, the brains to do it? Probably not. But in theory, I do understand where Gaspery is coming from. That feeling of, well, what's stopping me? Something entirely intangible and a raw kind of interesting, just begging to be explored. And it's kind of just freely available and it's paid work. Yeah, I do it, I think. At least I do get what's pulling Gaspery in. Given this is a time travel job, there's no real rush to get Gaspery sort of out there doing stuff. He needs to complete a lot of training first. It's years before he's first sent out there. I believe it's about five years or so. Just before the training, we do get, we don't want to place you at the center of the anomaly, which in hindsight is very funny. <laughs> before, and I mean literally as his body is being prepped for his first mission, we learn that Zoe was the one that gifted Marvin the cat to Gaspery. We also learn that Marvin started his life in 1985. But thanks to problems with an Institute member, he's now 416 years in his future. And in the grand scheme of things, it does not matter. It really doesn't. But it's just... <laughs> I don't know how I'd really feel if I found out if Lily and Zelda were from 1608. <laughs> It's just hard to conceptualise, but I do, I, genuinely it did make me laugh, I thought that was very funny, it's just like a, it's a silly, he's very close to his cat, 
I mean, he lives on his own. His cat is his company, and he's never had a super close relationship to his sister. But <laughs> it's meaningless that his cat is from the past. It's more to bring focus to the fact that we had another time traveler who didn't, who was trying to get an out. But his first mission isn't to talk to anyone we've actually met before, but instead he's meeting with the violinist at Oklahoma City Airship Terminal. He's a busker, effectively. And like I said before, the violin music that is playing in Vincent's footage is not Paul Smith's work. It is within the footage itself. And also, I was writing about this and being like, oh yeah, his name's Paul Smith. Why does that sound familiar? He's a designer. It's a generic enough name. It's not important. It's not like, you know, she's gone, here's this composer, Coco Chanel. But yeah, he's a designer. I checked. It, look, it seems to be classic, simple vibes. Simple and timeless. It's nice. Certainly not in my price range. But anyway, it's nice. Point, point in the side tangent. I was just like, oh, his name's Paul Smith. That seems familiar. Fashion designer. Anyhow. The interview is a little awkward, <laughs> to say the least. It's very clear that Gaspari hasn't done this before and he's still finding his feet. And it sort of feels like we are just seeing it because it's his maiden voyage through time at first. But this does come back in a big way later on. Another one of those moments where Mandel really knows how to tie her narrative together. And... When he gets back from this, he is a little apologetic for things not going super smoothly, but it could have gone far worse, and we do get a good bit of important information. Firstly, Gaspari reveals to Zoe that Talia not only tried to warn him against joining the Institute, but that she did so by telling him classified information, and that becomes very important later on. And we also learn more about people being lost in time, and that's not an accidental thing. It's not, say, an issue with technology or anything like that. If an Institute employee is seen to be intentionally messing with the timeline, saving the drowning woman from the previous analogy, they will be lost in time, meaning that they're effectively exiled. Most commonly, it seems this punishment consists of finding an unsolved murder in history and having the detractor serve a sentence for that. As Talia explained to him before, the Institute's interests are the Institute and everything else and everyone else is secondary. This is the only thing that caused me a bit of confusion because timelines are complicated. So Olive Llewellyn later on is looking up the name like looking up Gaspari's name throughout history and she does find a prison sentence. Obviously, that's where this is going. But um, it's one of those things where I'm like, would, they have, would the Time Institute not have seen that? But at the same time, she had to really dig in to find that. And there weren't necessarily pictures. It could just be a name. So it's one of those things where it's like, ah. Uh... And it's not obviously on the timeline for him because there isn't a set timeline for a time traveler so it's one of those things where it's like eh, i can suspend any disbelief with it i it's something that too, it's something that you would overthink rather than ever actually going oh but that doesn't really make sense it's an overthinking type thing anyway we don't really see Gaspari's side of things with edwin in 1912 or with morella and paul in 2020 but after his chat with Zoe, we pick up exactly where we left off at the end of Olive's last section in 2203. He's interviewing her about her work. He's asked a question about the anomaly related scene in Marion Bad, and she's just asked if they can be off the record. As you might imagine, it was a description of her own experience repurposed for her fiction. She heard the violinist and then effectively experienced the reverse of what Edwin and Vincent did finding herself at the maple tree in Cayette for a brief moment and feeling very overwhelmed and confused. <laughs> he looked at her and seemed to grapple with what to say next. This will sound silly, he said, in tones of forced lightness, but my editor over at Contingencies magazine likes me to end interviews with a fun question. Olive clenched her hands together and nodded. Okay, so 
he said, this is a kind of a question about destiny. I guess. Olive noticed that he was sweating. Barring some kind of unforeseen catastrophe, assuming that our technology continues to advance, we'll probably have time travel in the next century. If a time traveller appeared before you and told you to drop everything and go home immediately, would you do it? How would I know they were a time traveller? The door was opening and Olive's publicist was coming in. Well, let's say there was something about that person that couldn't be reconciled. For example, Gaspery leaned forward, speaking softly and quickly. Well, for example, suppose this person were an adult, he said. Now suppose this person, this adult, in his 30s, had a name that you'd made up for a book that you only published five years ago. How's it going in here? Aretta asked. Great, Gaspery said. Your timing's perfect. You could have changed your name, Olive said. I could have. He held a gaze. But I didn't. His tone brightened as he rose. Olive, thanks so much for your time. Especially that last question. I know fun questions are the worst. And, ooh, baby. Look, the foreshadowing wasn't exactly subtle. This was happening somewhere along the line. But she brought it about so damn well. He's telling her to head home because in the quote-unquote correct timeline, Olive is supposed to remain on Earth for a few more weeks, finish her book tour. There's the pandemic starting out as she's starting this tour. By the end, she's supposed to be dead. Because of this new virus, this pandemic that's starting, she's the drowning woman. And despite everything, Gaspery's humanity prevailed over what the Institute wants. He had to save her. And he does, too. She cuts the tour short and she heads home straight away back to her family. It's also brilliant work with Olive's publicist, Aretta, coming in. It doesn't seem like anything. It just seems like she's coming in to check on him. But it's just like a... It's a fantastic sort of in hindsight or on second reading type detail. We learn later on that Aretta is another agent at the Institute. Gaspery knew there would be other people on this case. He knew that, that he would not know who they are, but he went ahead with his actions anyway. Again, it's a great detail. It's easy to miss or look over, but it makes the revelation make you go, oh, that's right, she was there. And Olive is very quick to act. It isn't a case of, oh, I should get my stuff, go home, sort of that. She just leaves her stuff at the hotel and just gets home. It's literally just airship terminal, phone home, tell her husband to take her kid out of school. And when she gets home, she's riddled with fear, which isn't exactly unreasonable. She wasn't explicitly told about what was, quote unquote, supposed to have happened to her. But if a time traveler comes to me and tells me to go home immediately to save myself, I'm having a week long panic attack. She ends up in a lockdown with her husband and young daughter. She still has to do her lectures and her interviews, etc. But it's all virtually. We know how we know how all that works. But rather than using Teams or Zoom or anything like that, it's done more virtual reality and hologram style. She's not allowed to leave the house at all, apart from for medical appointments. No hour-long walks for exercise, and there are patrolling officers there to punish you for breaking the rules. I don't, I don't know if they're patrolling like, people, officers, or if it's anything more sort of automated, but there are patrols coming round. But Olive needs a break, and occasionally she sneaks out just to sit under the tree outside of her house, which isn't even allowed. From her hiding spot, she sees him. To her, he's just the journalist that sent her home. Might not have been lying about being a time traveller either. He's not alone, though. She won't know this, but we can see that he's with Zoe, and it's very clear he's in trouble. I assumed he may well be lost in time right here and now, but that's not so. Still, he's not out of the water just yet, and Zoe is pressing him to come home. But she gets it. She's clearly scared about the consequences of his actions. She's his older sister, for God's sake, but their conversation isn't long. Patrol is on their way, and in an instant, the two of them are gone. Olive looks Gaspery up that night, but nothing comes up outside the sort of character in her book, and... She has the feeling like something isn't right with the magazine that he said he was working for, that Contingencies magazine, because 
the magazine itself is dormant there aren't many articles and there's no sign of it on any social media or anything like that it just it very much seems fake and later she spends more time researching trying to find Gaspari's name anywhere else in history accepting that he may well have been a time traveler on another night of searching a centuries-old academic journal yielded a reference to a Gaspari J Roberts the journal had been devoted to prison reform the hit sent Olive down a rabbit hole, at the end of which she found prison records from Earth. Gaspary J. Roberts had been sentenced to 50 years for a double homicide in Ohio in the late 20th century, but there was no picture, so Olive couldn't be sure it was the same man. And I figured this was his punishment for the Olive meddling, and as it turns out, that's only part of it. I also don't have a brain cell, and I didn't put two and two together with, like, info that we already have but yeah we'll get there and if you, i assume you may have already put two and two together of what that sentence is for <laughs> when she and gaspary that being zoe and gaspary return to their own time we find that while his actions cause no real problems for the timeline or the institute meaning he won't really be punished zoe tells him it might be worth just removing his tracker being done with this she doesn't want to lose him He's about the only person she has left, but he thinks there's a chance to sort this out. Reluctantly, she enters a new coordinates in for him. Maybe he can fix this. He might just have what it takes to fix the anomaly. He lands in Kayette, 1994, barely changed since 1912. He heads through the woods towards the giant maple tree. No priests get up this time, but the terrain isn't too much easier to traverse. He finds a good hiding spot where he can see Vincent coming, but she won't be able to spot him. She's getting closer to the tree, stopping under it, and moving her camera when... Reality broke. Gaspari and Vincent were in the cavernous, echoing cathedral of the Oklahoma City airship terminal, where Oliver Llewellyn was walking just ahead of them, and notes were, ra were rising from a nearby violin. And here too, impossibly, was Edwin St. Andrew, face upturned toward the branches slash the terminal ceiling and despite having had descriptions of this moment before it feels different this time at least for me it might not be so true when you're just hearing me describe the book and you've not had those descriptions before but there's almost but not quite a, a new sense of clarity to it we've spent time with all of these people now and it's so brilliantly done but it doesn't matter what he's seen it isn't fixed and the institute wants him out of commission Gaspari knows there's more he needs to do, questions he still needs to ask, and it's too late for that. But Zoe can't help but just want to be his sister. She overrides the decommission order on his devices. It's sibling love in an incredibly understated way. It doesn't matter that this might damage her career. It's about loving her brother. At first, he heads to a party in 2007 to try to talk to Vincent, but he has to avoid Morella. And on seeing her, he has a realisation as to what his fate is. So this is presumably he's done a bit more research on Morella since, and we haven't seen it, but presumably he now knows more about Morella after the first time he met her. When he's like, hey, we've met before. But before that fate, he has to see Edwin again. Six years later in 1918, by this time, Edwin has seen horrors that no man should see during his time on the Western Front. He goes to the garden one day and looks towards the bench only to see a man that he was certain he'd hallucinated. And who can blame him? If I saw what he did in Kayette, followed by his strange interaction with fake priest Gaspary, I'd assume I'd lost my mind too. Now, Gaspary explains to Edwin that it wasn't a hallucination, but for me... He feels like it would only cement that I wasn't sane, but hey, it works for Edwin. He just, there's a particular way that he explains it that just feels a bit like, no, you totally weren't losing your mind, I promise. But this is another timeline alteration. Edwin was, quote-unquote, supposed to die in a psych ward. He ends up back at the Institute, does Gaspary, knowing it'll be the last time. He has to face his punishment now. And him asking Ephraim to make sure that Marvin, the cat, is still looked after genuinely made me start tearing up. But if you hadn't figured it out, as I didn't, until he was at the party, where he goes, oh, that's what's happening. <laughs> so if you hadn't figured it out, as it 
it, it took me a bit too long. He's being sent to the underpass. The scene Morella and her sister stumbled upon. Gaspari is being set up as a double murderer. And of course, that's why he knows who he's looking up at. Why he says Morella. He's going to have some clue as to what this moment is. We don't see much, too much from his prison time. And I do wish we might have been able to spend a little more time with him there. Not necessarily a huge amount of time more than we did. But I just wish we had, well, yeah, a little more. But about 25 to 30 years in is where we get to more than smaller passages. Just kind of describing little bits. We get some regular prose as you would expect. Being a time much before his own, there aren't quite the same medical advancements yet. So when he begins to have heart trouble, he can't be fixed up quick time as he would have been able to in his own time. He has to be sent to prison hospital. Gaspery. I felt a sharp pain in my arm. I gasped and almost cried out, but a hand was over my mouth. Shh, Zoe whispered. She looked like she was in her early 40s. She was wearing a nurse's uniform and she had just cut the tracker out of my arm. I stared at her, uncomprehending. I'm going to place this under your tongue, she said. She held it up for me to see. A new tracker. To correspond with a new device that she was pressing into my hand. She had drawn the curtain around my bed. She held her device against mine for a second or two until the devices flashed in quick coordinated pattern. I stared at those lights and we were in a different room, in a different place. I love their dynamic so much. She never has to say that she loves him. She just constantly tries to do what's best for him, even if sometimes having to take possibly dangerous actions as this is or could be, no matter what, that's just her little brother and she moves him to the year 2172 23 years before he had originally interviewed the violinist at the airship terminal now it turns out zoe did get arrested the day that gaspery was sent back to get framed sexually given her clean record she only served one year and the institute it turns out isn't the only one with the ability to time travel. As they believe is the case. After she finished her sentence, she moved to the far colonies and found an organisation with a machine of their own. I made this mission a condition of agreeing to take the job in the far colonies, she said. I'm sorry I couldn't come sooner. I mean, to an earlier point in time. I think it's safe here, Gaspery. I built a paper trail for you. You should settle in, meet the neighbours. Zoe, I can't thank you enough. You'd do the same for me. Unspoken between us, I couldn't do the same for her. She was, she was of a different order from me and always had been. I don't know if we'll see each other again, Zoe said. Had we hugged before? I couldn't remember. She clasped me close for just a moment, stepped back and was gone. God, this scene devastated me. And yes, of course, I was crying. I nearly started crying <laughs> reading it again. It's me. I am a crier through and through. And he's now a boarder at a farm property. And I like the similar feeling as with Edwin at the start. No, it isn't a one-to-one -one reflection, but there's ringings of the beginning. And he's boarding in a place owned by two older women. And fearing that he might be recognised if slash when he ever does decide to leave the farm, he decides to find a way to get like a complete facial reconstruction. We're not talking like Ollie London here. He has a whole new face. He should not be recognisable at all. But yet, it is one that's familiar to him when he sees himself in the mirror. Soon after, he finds a violin. And I was just... Oh, that's brilliant. Everything is interconnected. Beyond the investigation, I had been wondering how Gaspery fit into the anomaly. Like, obviously, yes, he has been investigating everything, but there was just, there was no way he wasn't also actively part of it. He's been everywhere. And I think this being how he fits into it, not the investigation fitting into it, works so well. Also, obviously, that's why he recognised his brand new face. He's met that face before. And one of the women he's boarding from tells him that he should consider venturing out beyond the house. He wouldn't have to go far, 
but effectively telling him to heed his sister's words and meet to the neighbours. He does as he's told, and at about the same age as he is now, is Talia. It's been a little bit since we've seen her, so just in case you've forgotten, we first met Talia when they were kids. She lived in Olive Llewellyn's old house, and they later worked together at the hotel, where she basically said, screw confidentiality, when warning him against joining the Time Institute. There was a reason Zoe told him to meet the neighbours. She not only knew Talia was there, but is the reason for her being there. After he gets back from the awkward interview, his first trip out, he told Zoe about the whole Talia telling him classified information thing. And it is said that, like, yeah, she was going to have had a talking to at the very least, but chances are she was going to get arrested for that. So Zoe brought Talia for a short time to the outer colonies but to make sure she was safe from extradition brought her to the time and place we're seeing her with Gaspari now this is one of those books I could and maybe should read multiple times everything comes back and fits into place so well Mandel has pure patience with her work so many little moments coming back at the right time everything matters it's excellent and later the two of them are married it's within that first year of the meeting well re-meeting i suppose and they become owners of the farm when the two owners pass the issue with gasprey's life in the institute is that he basically accidentally learned a good amount the about the life of the man that he is now both the stuff that zoe made up so he has a paper trail and the as it were genuine stuff about the actual living man that is not Gaspery, as it were. He knows Talia dies before him, and he knows at some point after that, he moves to Oklahoma City and starts busking. But knowing that doesn't necessarily make it any easier. And while I was wrong about 99% of my theories, or at least, you know, not quite on the mark, I did get this one around the time he went back to see vincent and kayette just before he started following her into the woods i wrote down in my notes something like is gaspery the anomaly and i was right so this whole anomaly the institute was trying to solve they basically created it by sending gaspery out there to investigate he's in too many places at once as it were it's especially prevalent that it's like there's two of them there at Oklahoma City at two point Oklahoma City Airship Terminal at the point of the interview. Olive is there too, hence why she experiences it. And obviously he's been with Edwin and Vincent right when they experienced it. And this isn't just time stuff, remember. It's an anomaly in the simulation that we're all living in. That's what's gone, ah, too many Gasperies at once and caused all of this. It's kind of as if you try to name three files exactly the same thing and somehow your computer let you do that and then you try to play any of those files, it probably wouldn't because it would go, wait, but that's that and do you want this file or that file? And it's all too much at once, you couldn't handle it. And it all just falls together so beautifully, ending with our older Gaspery, the violinist busker. It ends with his side of the initial interview. It's just an incredible piece of fiction. I picked it up kind of offhandedly, a case of going, yeah, I like Glass Hotel. And this story does seem interesting. I'll give it a go. And it's blown me away it was so easy to get invested in even with that opening being slower than the rest of the book i love the way the story grows and calls back to earlier moments making everything fit and make sense i was able to get my conspiracy brain on and look i might have been wrong the vast majority of the time but just the act of going down the rabbit hole with this book was enough. If I had the time, I'd absolutely read this multiple times to see all the little things I missed or didn't remember where they came back up. Because obviously I read stuff, took notes, but to create a script like this, I've had to properly go back over the book 
to put a timeline in place. And there was stuff that I picked up, like with Aretta coming in to the interview. I hadn't quite remembered that in the first place. I was just like, oh, yeah, that was her publicist. That's a really cool detail. It was so much better in hindsight. Like, this wasn't supposed to be such a long script. But as I started, I realized there was no way I could have condensed my thoughts about this at around the same time that this is coming out. I will have a short review of it and it's just going to look so weak in comparison to this. But thank you for sticking with me on this journey. I have still managed to make this video shorter than I expected. So I hope you had fun. Tell me what books you you've read that had you feeling like a complete conspiracy theorist about the plot i love more rabbit holes to fall down i think i have i have three more library books to read i thought i only had two <laughs> but you're getting more videos than that i am still scripting a long bad rep book club but hopefully i can finish these borrowed books soon I am considering sending some back to my friends and just being like, it's fine, I'll read them at some point in the future. But anyway, feel free to like, subscribe, put your notifications on and all the other cringe shit I'm supposed to ask you to do. I hope you have a wonderful day, a wonderful night, a wonderful whenever you are watching this. Take good care of yourselves. Right. Right.